Everyone welcome for me as well. I'm happy to be back again. It's almost like a classroom meeting. Uh, the older alumni are also here and the younger students also attend and it's wonderful to be back at the Liebig. In this, this morning we want to talk about transformation and um, considering this uh, we have to admit we had um, like a Higge situation. Everything somehow went well, uh, well being ensured and we knew our kids would be even better off. But now something seems to have changed. So uh, the pandemic created the first hiccup for this Higge situation. Then the uh, uh, war actually really shook the very f uh, foundation of our Higge situation. And with climate change we feel as if the roof was coming down on us. So many things have changed over the past few years and we feel insecure and do not know. Uh, should we refurbish or tear it all down and build a new, there are new tools available, lots of tools. There's uh, digitalization, there's lots of uh, technology to find climate change. There's lots of potential in, in with young people. So we're actually ready for transformation. But how do we really roll it out? Uh, protect climate, uh, secure well-being and welfare. These are all challenges for the European way of life. So this is the official topic for my first panel and I look forward to the guests that I can discuss this with. Please welcome to the stage the Vice President of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. This is important. Um, former Prime Minister of the State of North Rhine westphalia to October 21 uh, and this is his home turf. He is uh, the European Aachen citizen. Welcome Armin Laschet. Maybe you want to take a seat over here. And talking about digitalization, then one country is always mentioned as the role model and that is Estonia. And this is why it is particularly exciting to get a view from Estonia. And uh, Tavi Roivas uh, used to be the f uh, Prime Minister f uh, until 2016 of the Republic of Estonia. And he was the youngest uh, Prime Minister of the EU. Um, so welcome Tavi Roivas. Mr. Reuvers will be speaking English and I'm using this opportunity that we will of course have simultaneous interpretation again. So please take your seat. Channel 1 is German, <laughs> not Germany, and Channel 2 is English. And for uh, um, um, attendants who wear actually aids uh, for hearing impairments, we have specific devices available for you as well. You might say it's a men's world, um, thinking of the banking sector and the Catholic Church because the management level is definitely a male level, but there's transformation happening there. And representative, this is Maria Kolak. She's president of the National Association of German Cooperative Banks. And since 2020, she has been the economic advisor to the Pope as one of six women in the Economic uh, uh, Council. She was uh, born in Croatia, and, but she is now a Berliner, a Berlin citizen. And um, she started her career at the Berliner Volksbank. A very warm welcome to Maria Kolak. And um, uh, and um, uh, Accenture would have also uh, fit uh, the uh, um, advising position to the Pope in the Vatican um, because they are really focused on digitalization. And we look forward to Boris von Klebowski. Um, the speaker mentioned in your agenda is unavailable. And this is why Mr. Klebowski will be joining us. He is in the management um, of uh, Accenture and he looks after government relations for Germany, uh, Austria and Switzerland. So a very warm welcome to you, Mr. Grabowski. 
you were so fast. Maybe let me add, he is also uh, working for the uh, SPD and he leads the digital group um, in this party. So let me start with you, Mr. Laschet. I just said a minute ago that our European model no longer works so, so smoothly. Um, each uh, um, panelist will actually uh, answer with a slightly longer statement and then we will actually just go into a debate and open the floor for questions. Um, uh, Mr. Laschet, uh, is the European way of life no longer possible that we have to say goodbye to this? Well, people frequently say we've never had as much transformation as yet. Everything's complicated. Our life model is no longer feasible. I think in this respect, we've forgotten what everything has changed, what all, all, all the things that have changed in recent years. If you look back to 8990, back then, everything was uh, thrown upside down. We had all geared ourselves up to say we're the West, we're in a free world. The East were, was part of the Warsaw Pact, there was a military threat and, and nothing, not much had changed. And then we had the revolution in Central and Eastern Europe, courageous people in Poland, Hungary, including also in the Baltic states. And all of a sudden the, there was a completely new order. Europe was no longer how it had been. There were new member states and all this took place in the last 30 years. So I think the last 30 years were not that uh, stable. Then in 2019, 2009, we had the first climate conference in Rio, 1992. And since this conference, we have been discussing climate change and how, we, how to deal with this. And then roughly 10 to 15 years ago, the iPhone was invented. Uh, this gets showed us digitization, but we had digitization in the past, but it, it accelerated at an incredible pace. Yesterday, I was at the University of Applied Science Berlin, and a professor showed me, he said, look, we're developing this. This is a transport device which will transport parcels from house to house. And I said, well, I, I saw this 10 years ago in Essen. Or in, in Estonia, there are people, these things are driving through uh, Estonia. So transformation is taking place. And at the moment, everything that we have as a challenge in transport, in transformation has been um, made even more dramatic by a war um, in, in Europe. That's what we refer to as a change of times that has forced us to improve our military defense strategies. I remember the uh, general election council where the 2% th uh, threshold was seen as um, upgrading our military capacity now it's seen as not being enough so that shows us how times have changed and ju just that the other things that we have mastered, we have to approach these calmly, uh, objectively, without getting unnecessarily uh, uptight, without um, allowing populists to use this transformation and the fears of people. Without, we must manage this in a, in a, in a calm and controlled manner. And the more factual information we have, the better. When you say without. Uh exaggerated hectics. Uh, well, many, many uh, climate uh, movement supporters say we don't have the time for that. Yes, so I'm a bit surprised that we're bringing coal-fired power stations back online. And in 24, 25, we will be burning more coal than the years before. So if everything had to be as hectic as that, then we'd have to set different priorities but we will uh, use uh, these coal reserves in the coming years on the basis of decisions that uh, we have to take in German and this Germany and decisions others have taken differently. Mrs. Kollack, what would you say if we say we have to drive transformation, accelerate transformation uh, coming from a financial uh, background? Uh, what is your main focus? Yes, of course, and uh, how um, do uh, uh, does funding actually promote this transformation? Well, thanks very much for inviting me um, to speak on behalf of the Nasser Association of German Cooperative Banks. Uh, the cooperative banks look at this joint path. What has been mentioned, uh, hectic 
a hectic approach is bad to start with. I think we're all ad well advised to pursue um, uh, ambitious goals and the triad of saying we want to secure jobs, we want to look after the climate, but we will also want to secure a welfare state, well-being, prosperity. This is a challenging um, goal if you don't want to uh, actually um, fall short. And the question is, is the preparedness there to actually um, accept uh, compromises? And uh, economy needs ecology and ecology needs economy. What we discuss with the SMEs in particular is uh, how can a company today use more and more renewables, but what it takes today uh, is uh, to actually work with the existing jobs, um, speaking of coal, and these companies generate with their current business models uh, the money needed for, for tomorrow's business models, and we're supporting them in this, and this is a huge challenge. Uh, until 2030 alone, there is a forecast that we need 900 billion euros. Well, we might say, well, the, uh, the government is to sort this out. But when you actually look at the formula, then you know that nine parts are paid by business and only one part are paid by the industry. And this is why we need investment um, to actually uh, ensure entrepreneurs. And this is why we assist our companies in this change um, to be towards becoming greener companies. But from zero to one, this does not work. Everything else would be an illusion and it wouldn't be serious and it wouldn't be fair towards the current and the future generation. But is it honest to say we can maintain this prosperity? Don't we have to cut back somewhere? Don't we have to change our lives in such a way? Um, you can no longer think that uh, our kids will do better. This is the end. Well, when you want to secure prosperity, then there is one factor to beat or to grapple with, and this is inflation. Let's uh, look at agriculture as an example. Everybody would like to have organic agriculture. We all like this. The uh, the uh, um, uh, the liter of uh, organic milk, fruits, regular milk, is only two cents. This is the so. Not uh, everybody can afford organic milk. Um, and this is why we have an additional brief and task to actually um, uh, um, uh, create value chains that allow people to find employment, their new digitalization um, uh, tools, chat GBT. What does this do with our structures in our country? Um, so it takes, uh, you have to widen the perspective. I mentioned it before, when we talk about digitalization, then we love to look towards Estonia. Your country has already um, mastered a transformation that we're f far away from. Could you tell us how you mastered this transformation and whether it was more a question of being willing to do so or whether it was, after all, a question of money? <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, uh, I would like to say on, on your first point that the uh, European model is very much alive. And coming from a country that was occupied until uh, the time I was 12 years old and, and starting with a country from basically zero in, in every sphere of life and wanting to get as far as possible from this totalitarian uh, yeah. regime, I would say that the um, you know, European model is the most sustainable um, uh, model of life out there. And there is still a lot of European countries and people of European countries who are pursuing for that. Mm -hmm. If you go to Kiev, if you go to Chechnya, many other European cities that are not yet uh, part of European uh, Union family, you see more European Union flags than here in Aachen or, or in my hometown in Tallinn, or even for, for more than in Brussels, by the way. So they demonstrate a will to, to join this uh, European way of life, and, and I think this is very positive, and this is a compliment for us. Now, coming to Estonia, it's not only digitalization. Of course, digitalization is 
something we are known for and, and yes we did start the country from zero and, and this happened to be in the 90s when internet was becoming a thing and it was possible to basically opt for the latest uh, technology there was no point of, uh, of uh, opting for like some uh, old technology uh, and it really we really do have questions why some other uh, countries uh, take so much time in this but this is not only digitalization I think the main thing we wanted to get as far as possible from the totalitarian regime and I think the biggest lesson from Estonia and Lithuania from that matter and, and Latvia and some others is <coughs> it's actually possible um, we live still next to Russia but we are the least dependent countries on Russian energy the least dependent we can live without Russian energy because mm. we understand that nothing good is ever coming from East, uh, from our perspective. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, economy. Uh, in the, until the, the Estonia was occupied, all of our economy was linked to so Soviet Union, everything. Today, it's, I don't know, 2%, 1%, even less perhaps. Before the w current escalation of the war uh, uh, last year, we, it was like 4%, nothing. We live next to Russia, but we know that these are not the guys to do trade with. They are not reliable. And we have, by the way, told that uh, some, some wanted to listen, some, some not, but that's a, that's a, a different story. And I think um, um, it's, it's very important that also now looking at Ukraine, after the, uh, Ukraine will win the war, and, and the Ukraine will win the war, uh, there needs to be a lot of... Uh, building from zero a lot of uh, factors of life uh, be it economy be it the societal reform also coming uh, to the eu family it's not just like we political decision there's a lot of criteria that need to be met and of course we need to support ukraine in in uh, fulfilling those targets so yeah answering the question short european model is very much alive yes we need to do some uh, changes in our um, pattern of consumption uh, but that's a different story and, and i would comment mm -hmm. on that later thanks okay well that's very interesting thank you very much also die verknüpfung auch von so the linking of transformation and uh, democracy i think uh, we should uh, uh, drill a little bit i would like to ask you mr grebowski where do you currently see looking at europe and uh, where do you see the biggest obstacles in uh, to transformation in germany thank you very much for allowing me to come and speak to you today um, there are many things that secure our European model and the role of, t I want to talk about the role of transformation. Uh, in many companies, uh, we can see how they are preparing for the challenges or what the challenges are. Uh, in Strasbourg on the 9th of May, the Chancellor Scholz quoted Paul Valéry, a French uh, author, um, uh, whether things will turn out that is, I don't know, but he gave, uh, he presented a, a picture of the Asian mainland and said if we don't get to that stage, then we will need the ability to take political decisions above all talking about public goods, like for example our security, availability of resources, and the ability to implement climate change. But uh, the task of politics, Mr. Laschet, is to create a reliable technical infrastructure and uh, stable framework conditions concerning data security and digitization. But for European companies, this means opportunities through using these opportunities through new tech forms of technologies for their companies and simultaneously reducing dependencies. And together with the digital uh, association Bitcom, we have calculated that digitization can save one in five tons of CO2. So technology will become a part of critical infrastructure in the future. And Mr. Reuvers, we can learn a lot from your country, Estonia, where 99% of official services are available digitally. I mean, in Germany, we can only dream of such a situation. But the good news is that uh, Europe is waking up. We are starting um, to look at our European sovereignty in relation to the major powers uh, Asia, uh, Asia, Russia, uh, USA, we begin to fill this with more love. Europeans are good partners of the USA. We share their values. But at the same time, we need own technical competence in order to ensure our own political and economic freedom. 
the CHIPS Act, for example, uh, enables us to invest 43 billion euros in the ability to produce our own chips. Through the Net Zero Industry Act, the European, Un European Commission has set a target of uh, producing two-thirds of the technology required for our aims here in Europe. The third good news is that in companies, digitization is, is gaining pace. The potential uh, 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 of digital business models has been understood much more slowly in Europe than in the USA. Uh, it's taken a long time to see how we can use this to reduce costs, but slowly but surely we're understanding that the uh, evaluation of data creates uh, platforms of ecological systems to develop new business models. And for this, we need virtual data rooms and clouds. These uh, uh, these can bring together all the services and data of a companies, and above all, artificial intelligence offers enormous potential that we have not yet realised. Chat GPT is uh, on everybody's lips, and you have correctly mentioned what this means in terms of jobs in certain industries. But at the same time, a study by Bitcom carried out last year. Uh, revealed uh, an open-mindedness towards AI, but up to date, only one third of the business has invested in AI, and many companies in the EU expect a further fragmentation and regional um, uh, the, the, the breakup of the economy. But the only thing that we can have is uh, AI on all levels of a company, and the big majority of the companies that we have uh, questioned. We uh, questioned them at DevOps this year. Most of these companies are so-called transformers. They place their faith in new technology, but frequently only in individual areas, in silos. And unfortunately, European country companies are particularly re reluctant in this uh, case. And a large percentage of companies have set themselves the target of uh, become, declaring continuous development to be part of their strategy. But those who want to be successful must go through this process of permanent change. Silos uh, have no chance anymore, but there is no certification, no certification specialist for these procedures. These are people, doers, who have the courage uh, to tackle this case, and these are the people carrying out good work, uh, uh, bringing together competitiveness, and climate uh, protection and ensuring our, our, our well-being, our prosperity. Mrs. Kolak, when you look at uh, business, many say, well, I'm not investing in pl climate protection because I don't know, because it pays off whether it's really efficient. Uh, following the KT climate barometers, 48% uh, of the entrepreneurs say that they don't know whether it makes sense. Why is it so? Why do people know so little about it? Well, the colleague already mentioned it. There are various components uh, to an investment decision. Uh, profitability is such. Do I find markets? Uh, let's talk about or uh, stick to the uh, example of organic milk. Um, and what do I have to do to produce this organic milk? Uh, which technologies do I have? Um, what is uh, the red tape needed? What are the approvals required um, to really have the economic good available, the new machine, um, so that uh, it really starts producing? And when you then look at the political framework and the hectic discussions and the uh, um, meeting marathons, and uh, they tell you after 30 hours that you don't have, you should have a good feeling. You don't think that this is a well thought through decision. Um, we have the same plan. We're all um, on the same page. We have great plans in Germany. We're really the world champion at making plans. But to really um, make it happen, focusing on one or two, three points, and to actually customize the message for the people out there. There's so many people saying, well, how am I supposed to see this now? Heating, from the heating to um, whatever, infrastructure of, of uh, our state. We talked about Deutsche Bahn this morning, the German railways. 
So this is basic uh, topics uh, um, for a uh, location of industry. Um, and uh, we're talking about a high tax country. Um, and I want to talk about this. Is this maybe the problem, Mr. Lushit? that uh, this is taking place on all of the levels and that it is too much basically and that people feel insecure because uh, the communication is not very smart on the part of the government and then there's um, a lack of planning uh, uh, security for local authorities. So from your political point of view, what would be a good lever to do really do things, uh, to not feel overwhelmed by everything? So the first thing is that I think that was your question at the very beginning. Uh, do we have to uh, t step back from our prosperity model? If we look at all the turbulence in the world, war, the disasters and everything, if we now say to the people, and you're going to lose your prosperity as well, that you will not uh, generate enthusiasm for transformation, that would be uh, dishonest because uh, as a lot of transformation, innovation, you also uh, enable life to get better on a different level of quality. Why is an electrical vehicle, why is it a loss of prosperity compared to a combustion engine? I have both. Um, uh, that's a, a nice feeling when I drive through the city. But somebody would say to me, this is a loss of prosperity. And I say, no, this is a climate neutral form of transport. Travelling on a fast train is a, is a gain in quality, easier to do in France than in Germany, with less uh, high-speed stretches. Life um, on a, on a climate-neutral basis can be equally as enjoyable, perhaps even more enjoyable than in the past. If people say differently, then that's a bad thing. If we say some of the people in the last generation uh, say we want to move away from the capitalistic system, well, up until 1989 we were able to see how a planned economy, uh, communist system, sim systematically ruined uh, the environment. Those who were spent the time in the, DDR, DDR, in the GDR up until 1999 know what that means. So. Uh, this capitalistic system has always uh, created innovation and we must continue it in, t in terms of transformation and co-change. And if you look, there is research into many minor things so that we can learn how to master this technology for transformation. And we must tell people these things. And then we have the second social question. Just briefly, our uh competitors, uh, our competitor is China, and it's not a democracy. Okay, we can't change that. We're not going to improve the world if we travel to China and say, you can't do this, they won't be very impressed. So we have to uh, get them on our side for our objectives. If we want to get China to adhere to their, to their climate goals, not to build new coal-powered fire stations, and if they, don't, if they want to influence Russia to end the world, then it's not, cle not clever to travel to China and tell them everything they're doing wrong. Uh, gaining, winning over partners in foreign policy is, means defining common policy. China is part of the world, and another economic competitor of, of us is the USA. When major industrial companies uh, if they move from Germany to America for their uh, investments, and this is facilitated by the Inflation Combating Act, then the USA are competitors of ours. Uh, uh, when Mr. Macron formulated this, everyone criticized him, but it's true. We as Europeans must define our own strengths, carry out our own transformation, and do everything to ensure that we remain an industrial site. If I may add to this, one thing is Germany as a location of industry. The backbone of German industry is small and medium-sized companies. We need industry, but the foundation is the SMEs, and the SMEs at large cannot shift production to the US or anywhere else. And this is what causes concerns. So as we represent those SMEs, and we see it everywhere. North and South, that um, we uh, need
need clear impulses for small and medium-sized companies. Uh, let me uh, talk to you, Mr. Roivas. Um, how did you do this in your country? How can you convince companies uh, to join in these investments? And how important is the, the security, the planning security? Well, I think actually it was very good uh, that in the beginning when our session was introduced, uh, it was mentioned that we talk about megatrends and, and megatrends are things that you know even we cannot influence uh, even the European po policymakers cannot influence uh, because they are there whether we want it or not and two of the main megatrends uh, that are relevant in, in our today's context are technological development which is accelerating at huge pace uh, there used to be ages named after tools stone age bronze age so you know, it, it lasted generations then the industrial revolutions again lasting several generations and during our generation you mentioned iphone 15 years ago that was invented 15 years ago i remember from my childhood i was i was dreaming of um, of having a tv that i can carry on uh, to the beach that was something i saw from the finnish tv uh, finnish newspaper and i was thinking that this is you know my best thing of like consuming or this is the prosperity and now i'm like answering a bit of your question that you you were asking mr Laschet, uh, you know what about can we can we continue this level of prosperity i think the level of prosperity or, or how we define the prosperity is changing iphone again coming back to iphone it's a good example because 20 years ago before iphone that would have meant that uh, you need to own uh, video camera, photo camera, cassette player, I will tell the younger people later what that is, video cassette player, diapositive uh, player, this is to super old people like myself and some others here in the room, then, um, you know, mailman, yeah, atlas, exactly, maps, uh, then uh, travel bureau, uh, newspapers, and you can go on, and this is all like device this size, so we need a li little less uh, like uh, things to be produced in a way to, to have them um, in this device and everybody uses it. Like my grandfather who's 88 and he never uh, managed to use computers. Some of us still remember that MS-DOS was basically like hacking. Uh, you needed to write code to actually get to another folder. With iPhone it's not the problem. My, my daughter is four and she uses iPhone. So I think th these megatrends um, will influence our life um, uh, as we speak. And, and the definition of consumption and, and keeping our like European level of prosperity will change. I think for my children, having a personal car uh, is not the highest level of, of uh, prosperity. They don't care about cars anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I, I still love my car. I have a German car, by the way, electric. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So things are changing, but uh, of course, uh, with iPhones, for instance, we are dependent on raw materials that we don't have, that only exist in Africa, for instance. So we are in a global uh, tissue there, Mr. Grabowski. And um, what would you say? How? Can we accelerate this transformation without uh, making the whole society feel insecure? Yeah, I mean, uh, talking about how we can master this transformation so that we don't leave major parts of society behind, so we don't give them the feeling of being left behind by transformation. I think in Germany there are people who, uh, looking at the public infrastructure, have the feeling that they are being uh, excluded. They think that the investments are in conurbations and even in small federal states uh, like Berlin, you can see that there is a conflict between those within the suburban um, railway network and those outside. So how can, we, uh, balance, how can we explain what is the responsibility of the state and the responsibility of the private uh, business sector and with this massive poly transformation, it's not only climate change, not only technological transformation, but we're talking about our defense capabilities. Uh, we're talking about having to achieve this 2% um, level. We're talking about uh, significantly improving the infrastructure in the countries. We uh, have to pay our civil servants sufficient to put them on a level playing field. And, and to be able to use technologies effectively and, and, uh, to get the people um, that, that have to work there. Yeah.
wichtige. And this is uh, important for people in terms of prosperity. Um, this massive use of capital has to come from somewhere. And for decades, we have allowed our infrastructure to become decrepit because uh, uh, we have tried to balance the books too much, perhaps. Um, so more private investment. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think we all have a shared responsibility for education. We just heard about the young kid aged four um, managing technology um, taken for granted. But uh, people at large um, uh, need to know that uh, you can learn about these things. Education in our country uh, was already a problem uh, before COVID, but then we saw the disaster during the COVID period, uh, digital teaching. And what it takes is a, a renewed effort to get our population uh, fit or in shape for the future challenges. I would like to open the floor for you now and ask for your questions. And I would like to ask you to use one of the uh, microphones in the room. Or s there we also, I think, have mic runners reaching microphones. Um, to those who cannot move, because otherwise we won't be able to hear your question here at the panel. Thank you very much. Maybe you can briefly introduce yourselves. Bettina Leisen, Antwerps from Belgium. I'm a gynecologist and have uh, dealt intensely with the topics of health and nutrition, especially for cancer patients. And um, I would like to make a remark on what Mrs. Kolak said when you said that many people cannot afford organic milk. Don't we have to create a turn of the tide in the brains that uh, cheap is not the uh, um, sine qua non? In uh, 1970, 25% was accounted for of the income was accounted for by nutrition. Today, I think it's about 10% that you pay for income on food and nutrition. Shouldn't we advocate um, and help the institutions in charge of this and policymakers to tell people um, and enable people to live a healthier life without actually missing out and cutting back on other things? And uh, I'm. Um, alluding to the excellency that Mr. Roy was uh, mentioned um, when he said that the, his son is no longer interested in his own car. Let me give you one example. Uh, 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 my uh, kid actually uh, went through the uh, um, uh, classical uh, confirmation and what would you like to have I said and she said uh, I want a new backpack and uh, she actually walked to her local store picked it and then actually uh, actually ordered it via the internet and I uh, got mother said um, see this is a Belgian company with what you've just done to simplify matters you're only making the Chinese happy. So we have to change our attitude. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Kolak. Cheap uh, should uh, not be the sine qua non criterion. How do we create the attitude? Well, if we live this triad of, uh, of uh, sustainability, our governance, uh, we do not stand for a maximization of profits, our organization. This is an attitude. How can I, within my region and my cooperative banks, live and thrive in the regions? They work in the regions. This is where we pay our taxes, in the regions. 
And um, I think that uh, um, in the conurbations, uh, um, rural areas, uh, we can actually, uh, actually uh, strengthen this uh, attitude, this awareness, so that people learn and understand that the companies here in Aachen are contributing to society and therefore also deserve the income. Um, people are altruistic. Uh, they say, well, I would like to do this and that, and at the end of the day, they don't do so. And um, we still remember this mentality that thriftiness is cool. We have lost many things uh, because of being too thrifty. You, you want to comment this? Yeah, good aspect. Uh, <clears throat> food. Uh, we have the mentality that food and drink must be cheap above all and they, we make uh, compromises in terms of quality. For some people uh, who, can, uh, who cannot afford higher quality food and drink, this very quickly sounds like a project for the elite. Uh, we have to put people in a position to be able to assess what, are good, what is good and bad food and drink and then make sure that they are affordable for them. We can do a lot through agricultural technology to produce healthy food uh, at, at a costly and favorable price, but, uh, uh, but there will be nevertheless be increasing numbers of people in society who can't afford this. Would you say that there should be more legislation, for instance, uh, uh, what should be controlled, what should be com combined? Cantina, yeah. Yeah. Curry <laughs> um, <clears throat> Telling people what to do is, uh, makes no sense either. Other questions, please. Yes, I think uh, you were first. Can you please uh, go to the microphone and use the microphone? And then you are next. Hello, Mura Sefer of Arbeit in Europa e.V. and um, um, the Charlemagne Youth Prize Laureate. I have two questions. One on the employment dimension. I think um, you only briefly mentioned it, Mrs. Plettner, but I think you cannot talk about transformation without um, uh, referring to uh, the aging society in Europe and the uh, uh, scarcity of the shortage of skilled labor. I would have liked uh, to hear more about this, maybe also from you, Mr. Laschet. This uh, term of transformation, I think, is used as if it had, there had never been anything like that. But Eastern Europe has gone through a major transformation, and I wonder uh, what can we learn from this transformation, and also through the Eastern German perspective. Thank you very much for these two questions. Mr. Laschet, would you like to start by telling us how we should respond to this, uh, um, to this uh, shortage of uh, skilled labor, although we have as many people in employment as ever before, but uh, we're losing over up to 8 million workers over the next few years. In that time, it's just so Yes, um, this is a transformation that's been going on for decades, but the question is, what uh, transformation is mentioned more in the public debate? The, the warning of demographic change and loss of specialist workers. I think uh, Kurt Biedenkopf uh, mentioned this in the 1970s in a book. In the 1970s, 50 years ago. But it wasn't, no, wasn't a work of art because you just had to look at the birth statistics. You could see we had an aging society and that were less and less young people were being born. So roughly 20 years ago, I became generation minister because the idea came up to accompany this demographic change through political measures. The baby boomers in 1960s are now progressively retiring. The highest birth rate was in 1964, 1 1.3 million. Today we have only three to 400,000 births per year, so it's easy to work out that we have a, a shortage of skilled workers and that situation will not change. The question is how do we react? Of course, this means that we need immigration. There's no other solution. And we have to create a climate 
And, and another transformation is, is we have to become um, uh, more multicultural. In, in not only Australia, where 25 people have an immigrant or migrant background uh, amongst children, including in schools in Aachen, this figure is 40 to 50 percent. These will be the elite in 20 years' time. And if we know that, we must recognize the diversity, give everyone the chance to progress. And even then, it, it won't be sufficient if we just involve people who are already in the country. In addition, we will need managed immigration on a larger scale. And we always sort of saying at the moment, of course, we're saying we have terrible problems. At the moment, we have a lot of immigrants from uh, Ukraine. Many will return after the war. So in the coming years, this challenge will remain. And we, as Germans, will have to uh, campaign uh, as an, to present ourselves in, as, as an attractive country, because other countries are competing for the experts as well. And we're not necessarily the most attractive. Because we're lagging behind in digitalization, among other things. And, and the language is a problem. Many other reasons apply. Tax, uh, charges, no, no trains. So people are coming, but uh, the problem is uh, many who arrived in 2015 have still not found an entry to the labor market. Um, yes, uh, work-life balance. Uh, there are many setting screws uh, that are important over time. But don't forget about this aspect either. How much longer can we afford uh, uh, letting uh, a certain potential of the population lie idle, like a, a female workers. Yeah, but the younger generation wants to work less. Yes, exactly, correct. You mentioned it a minute ago, cutting back. Uh, I have three kids. Uh, I always had to cut back on certain things. So an individual decision is also needed here. If you want to have children as a woman and with your partner, uh, to really clearly say this is a deliberate decision. With, with three kids, you're really falling out of all of the normal um, family structures, but only from kid three, you're really benefiting society. And um, so you can only point in one direction, but uh, it also means um, um, own responsibility in helping society. In terms of the question of uh, uh, skilled workers in the future, we will have to think about new ideas in Europe of, in terms of training people. In particular, in Germany, we're very much based on references, uh, certificates, and when we get job applications, we only accept the people with the corresponding academic qualifications. We have to bear it much more in mind that we need to upskill and reskill people, perhaps in areas with, where they had nothing uh, to, in common in the past. Why can't we tr retrain a, a taxi fire to become a technician, for example? We do this uh, because otherwise we can't, for example, cover the demand for IT professionals. I think we have to go down more unconventional routes than we have done in the past. Okay. I might be wrong, of course, and, and this is always good to remember, but I think that Estonia and, and Germany ha, have come from so different uh, situations for the last uh, couple of decades. Estonians always feel that we have so much to win, and, and Germans have so much to lose. And this gives naturally a little bit different uh, attention or atmosphere uh, while you think of uh, topics ahead. Estonians need to be hungry, need to be hungry for success, hungry for uh, for um, uh, technologies, uh, all sorts of uh, kind of things that uh, improve our lives. Um, now, just if, if the question was what to learn, you know, it's very, very slippery slope uh, to tell that this is what we do is, is you know, somehow uh, usable here and there as well. But I think from our perspective, a good example has been that we have always tried to legalize uh, uh, and uh, enable uh, progress. Uh, I mean, you can be for or against the gig economy, it doesn't really matter, but it's here to stay. 
Some cities in, in, um, in Germany have legalized, uh, for example, Uber and Bolt, for example, yeah. Frankfurt. Some cities have not, like, for example, ha Hamburg. And this is uh, different uh, attention, and the Estonian way has always been, let's find a way how to legalize in this way that we benefit most, because we see that it's coming anyways, mm -hmm. and if we don't do it, they will do it in Riga or somewhere else. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that's the kind of mentality issue. And my last point, there's a lot of talk about uh, organic milk. You know, in my childhood, we had, we had nothing. We really had nothing, like, uh, you know, we couldn't even dream of, of buying uh, anything from Germany because you needed German Deutschmarks for that and, and we didn't have any, any way of getting those. <laughs> but you know what? We had plenty organic milk. <laughs> because the, Organic milk. Yeah, uh, that we still have, actually, <laughs> in the Soviet. We have uh, a lot of um, organic food because we <laughs> live in a luxury. We live, you know, between forests and bogs and actual mm -hmm. fields. You know, milk doesn't come from the shop, milk co comes from the cow. And this is like a big, big thing I, I hope I can also teach my, my children. And, and, you know, this for me gives like an interesting per uh, perspective. You sometimes you are missing things that you cannot have. And, and going uh, to, you know, missing organic milk is to me like very much going back to basics. So it's really like heartwarming mm -hmm. for me. Thanks. But oat milk is growing on fields by now. <laughs> This is also part of our transformation. The uh, question uh, about uh, Eastern Europe and Eastern Germany, this, is, this was exciting. Um, what Mr. Rauwa said was very important. We had so much to win. This was also true for the Eastern German citizens. They had lots to gain, but fee now feel left behind. Why hasn't it really properly worked and how can we tackle this? Good question. If you look at uh, surveys from Thuringia, you could see the AFD and the left party are both together above 50 percent. The classical democratic parties no longer have an, their own majority. The question is why? And I think perhaps this is this very complicated, many reasons, but I think the difference between the, uh, the Baltic states or other states in Eastern and Central Europe, I think the difference is that the entire country of Estonia started from zero and then has gone jointly down the same road and has then benefited from digitization. The Poles had their freedom uh, struggles, but they were always Poland beforehand and still are, and are now going down the road to the new era together. Eastern Europe, Germans, all of a sudden they find themselves in a unified Germany, and from that moment on, they're no longer comparing their life with people in Warsaw, Budapest, or Bucharest, but they're comparing their lifestyle with people in Cologne and Munich. And then, of course, economically, they are in a, in a worse position. Life is more difficult. And I think it, for, they would actually have many reasons to be proud because technology in the east of Europe is new, mainly new technology because it had to be renewed uh, after 1990. But in terms of prosperity, they always have the feeling that they have to compare themselves with other countries, other cities in the, other, in the west of the country. And this creates the impression of being second class citizens. Uh, for example, they don't um, get many jobs in the highest um, federal institutions. Uh, okay, they had uh, the German Chancellor for 16 years, but n at the end of the day, she was no longer seen as, as an East German, but in Estonia, things are different. And it's young people who are occupying the top positions. You have young prime ministers, and I think that's a, that's a major difference. As Mr. Laschet has said, we made a mistake as West Germans. Uh, we approached people with an attitude saying we have to educate them and say you should do everything like we have done. And we didn't look perhaps at certain things that they were able to do better than us. We said they were communists uh, and they're a bit stupid and we'll tell them how things work. And that was a mistake. And uh, th the way we did things at that time was perhaps the only solution. But if we look at the 
administrative structures. We were trying to force our structures, impose our structures on them, but that did not lead to creativity, encourage people to do something for themselves. But you might also say that uh, each citizen in the former GDR had uh, to put uh, their lives upside down. They had to rethink police, the insurance companies, everything else. So they're the specialists in transformations, aren't they? We could really leverage and use them, couldn't we? Wouldn't this be a good idea? Mrs. Pletner, uh, uh, one example from my experience, uh, I'm quoting Mr. Biedenkopf for the second time today. I'm not a particular fan of him. The m Prime Minister of Saxony said at the beginning of the 90s, he said, in the, 90, in the GDR we had a tradition in semiconductors. Let's um, make this known and focus on this. Today, a large share of European semiconductors is produced in the area around Dresden, and they're on, on a global level, the top of the World League. So an old skill from the GDR has been used as part of the transformation, and nowhere in Germany are so many semi, as many semiconductors made as in this area around Dresden. I asked a lot of the students where they came from, and a lot came from Aachen, and they had moved to Dresden. We should have ha produced 50 of such examples, used what we had in the GDR for the new era. We have a few more questions. Oh, Mr. Rovas. A brief uh, note. I think, uh, looking from Estonia, like, I, I cannot distinguish a person who has grown in West Germany or East Germany. For, for me, you are all the same, and I think there shouldn't be any, any difference in content. Neither are Estonians. Uh, we have ever, never been communists. We were just occupied for 50 years uh, by, by communists. And, and I think uh, it's, uh, it's also super important to remember, you, you mentioned digitalization and, and how this has helped us to develop. But also, I think it's fair to say, especially here in Germany, where Germany has been the biggest donor of the cohesion policy of European Union, I think it has been a tremendous success. And I think we should be very thankful for that. And also, I think, of course, uh, Germany is winning from that as well, because, uh, because we see that the prosperous Eastern Europe uh, is actually beneficial for the whole of Europe. And I hope, and one day, this day is not actually very far, when Estonia will be a net payer to European Union, we are very close to that. Uh, we are very happy to, to support Ukraine, Moldova, and others to join, and, and to, to help them also to this, uh, this level of, uh, of economic prosperity that we have achieved. So I think it's not only digitalization, also this European cohesion, this has been tremendous success. Mm -hmm. you, you had a question, uh, the white jacket and then you. Yes, please. Hello. I am the National um, Prize Laureate. Mr. Laschet, you said if there is no capitalism, there is communism. I don't think that this creates a lot of hope for young people, especially for our friends from Eastern Europe. I would like to ask the other panelists what uh, the um, alternatives are. What are the ideals, the role models that we are working towards to bring about this transformation? and to start this uh, zero hour. Uh, this was very hard to understand, I'm sorry. Could you please repeat the last sentence? The microphone didn't work too well. The question was, what is our alternative between capitalism and communism? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Social ecological market economy. I think uh, there's different things uh, uh, play an important role in market economy, but we have to look at the interactions. If we have social responsibility, economic strength, and ecological responsibility, when we bring all these three things together and dis use these two design uh, business models, uh, activities, that's something that must uh, encourage everyone to join in, to be part of this. Our problems are. Uh, bigger than they haven't been than they were for a long time, um, and especially in terms of climate change. So it must be should be a fascinating aspect to put oneself in, in a position to, and, and make oneself available and contribute towards mastering this climate change. And 
can social and ecological um, social economy be thought in one thing or uh, as I initially said um, this is a symbiosis I'm speaking on behalf uh, of an organization that uh, looks back on a over 170 year history so we have over 700 banks at uh, different locations federalist democratic and each shareholder in each bank also has only one one vote although um, it may hold more capital and the cooperative idea is a world cultural heritage by UNESCO because it uh, is based on own responsibility we're not calling for the state no we build and thrive on own uh, responsibility and subsidiarity even the smallest unit uh, once it can actually perform a task should perform this task and when you look beyond okay I cannot shoulder this by my own we come in uh, kick in and help if you combine these things smartly and without any hectic uh, approaches because we're all in the crisis mode and used to be for quite a while then this country with education infrastructure more ecological thinking can develop further I am positive I'm optimistic that we will be able to do it thanks very much you first please yes exactly The Square come from Romania. I'm a former uh, Charlemagne Prize winner. Okay. And I want to ask a question on a slightly different topic that was not mentioned until now. What is your opinion on the EU's emission trading system of the carbon credits? Because one goal of the EU Green Deal is that Europe will be carbon neutral until 2050, but we are still trading carbon credits. and. Mm -hmm. Maybe also for my colleagues who don't know how these carbon credits work, um, they're also known as carbon allowances and they work like permission slips for emissions. When a company buys a carbon credit, they gain permission to generate one ton of CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. No, yeah, if we think, think about carbon credits, what, what we think uh, about the credits. emission certificate, etc. Also, die, we, was sie, was, die Frage war halt eben, was the question was um, what we think about this emissions trading, right? That was their question. That's your question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Also, we have the Paris Agreement. We have the uh, green, the EU green deal, and the climate uh, pact. But geopolitically speaking, um, we face the fact that not many people comply with these rules. In so far, we have participants who undertake to comply, like we did it in the Federal Republic for specific sectors. There were certain developments of. Paths, but if the global commissions are taking place somewhere else, this is of course difficult. Emissions trading as such, uh, with a with, with a, a, a reasonable price structure, requires more um, and uh, above all for your standards, because com this complicates life even further. As international, the fact that this is even more complicated on the national level, national level is clear, but through this uh, emissions trading, we, st we still create comparative, comparable rules for 27 countries. Was the uh, person answering the question, asking the question, this system is, I, I consider the system to be the right one. We say that in five years, for example, not 2050, but between 2023 and 2028, we would like to reduce so, so much, uh, such and such an amount of CO2. And those who e emit CO2 must pay more and more as the years go by. That's a market economy mechanism. The uh, reduction amount is uh, clear. It has to be a certain amount by 2028. If you invest early, you don't have to buy the certificate. So it's a market economy incentive to change the technology in your company. If you do nothing, then year for year, things will get progressively more expensive. I actually think this is a very intelligent system. 
and this means we can achieve the CO2 targets with ecological means. The opposite model is our discussion regarding heat pumps. People say, as from day X, you mustn't uh, install any, any new ones. So what do people do? Up until day, up until day X, they're installing heating, uh, oil and gas heating systems. Same thing with, uh, um, uh, <laughs> with bulbs, with the light bulbs. Mrs. Plettner, if we offer a perspective and say we have to reduce CO2, that's one approach. I'm not against what you're saying, but I'm saying if you try to um, arrange things on a government level, there are many people who try to circumvent this. So the market economy approach that you've uh, that is the best one where you can plan yourself. There's so many questions. Let's uh, collect questions. I think you were first and we're running out of time. So let's uh, collect uh, two or three questions. Otherwise, we won't be able to finish on time. I was unaware uh, of... Uh, uh, Alexander from the European Socialism. I'm here from the uh, network of uh, Charlemagne Youth Prize Fellows. My question is, you have uh, uh, mentioned very small devices um, um, and the power is accumulated in many small companies. Uh, we have seen how many things are replaced by an iPhone, but producing these iPhones, there's a little consensus and three major companies predominate the market. None is in Europe. And uh, in terms of the companies, many, many, only a few in Europe uh, contain, can control the content of these apps and devices. And, and this, for the first time, we have a lot more jobs being reduced in Europe than created. So the jobs uh, uh, that are being lost in this uh, wave are people with less qualifications and the new jobs are for high qualified people who normally uh, come from a, a privileged background. Uh, um, and f my first, c could you, one, one quick question please. One, the first question is, so how can we justify this digitization wave without unconditional, an unconditional basic income? And our democratically legitimized uh, governments in Europe, how can they really control these major companies from other companies? Yeah. First of all, there was a question about uh, finding gray zones between market economy and communism. There is no such thing. Communism does not work. Let's not live in illusion. Uh, go to Cuba if you want to see the closest thing of communism and, and don't, don't have any uh, currency with you. Just try to live with the local currency and see how long it takes you. There is no model of communism that can actually work. That's the first thing. And now we go to the, the question of um, pretty much the, the same question. I think the biggest challenge in this is that in Europe we tend to hold on to legacy jobs too much and I know it hurts, and it's very, very blunt of me saying that, but we need to reckon when the jobs are changing and, and it's better to make the shift quickly, then we will survive. Uh, AI, uh, digital transformation, they will all lose some jobs in the, uh, when they're developing, but they will create so many others. Yeah. But again, let's learn from history. Today it's happening faster, and this, this is why it hurts more, and this is why it's easier to lag behind uh, if we compare ourselves to US or, or some other uh, regions. But uh, look at the history. There used to be tens of times more people working in agriculture. Most of those jobs, you would, neither of the youngsters here in the room would not want. There used to be a lot more people building roads. Would you want to do it without a tractor? I'm not sure, probably not. So, so let's just see where the jobs of the future are. Let's try to enable them and let's a little bit try as policy makers to try to hold uh, on less to the old jobs, including, by the way, the example of taxi drivers. That, that's, that, that hurts and I, I feel sympathy towards them, but taxi driver is a job that the, of the past. Mm -hmm. It will change. I need to realize that. Yeah, the question, the question uh, was also one about the unconditional basic income. In the past, people um, 
said that uh, a lot of jobs uh, of unqualified jobs are being lost but today we can see an urgent d demand for people without particularly high qualifications entire uh, areas of uh, catering tourism uh, railways they're on strike for higher wages because you can no longer find people for these jobs so the in in the low wage sector wages will probably increase and people will be sought for and needed. Maybe one last sentence on the unconditional basic income. When you have like a, a fund or a budget line from which you want to pay something, then this needs to be generated, this income by all. So uh, there is not such a thing as a budget line that is always full. This needs to be filled by somebody. The companies uh, generate the, the, the money that needs to be paid into this fund. But we actually pay this to the state, and the state can only redistribute what has been produced before or generated before. It's easy to, to speak about an unconditional basic income, but uh, who pays for this? So we have to face those these as well. Well, this is a, a separate discussion. Um, we wanted to come in on digitalization again. Perhaps uh, two things. The realization that it affects the people with the lower or medium qualification levels or people from non-privileged backgrounds. I think this idea, this concept is only in part correct. For example, we will see through chat GTPT that uh, jobs will be called into question, for example, banking, insurance, uh, accounting, jobs will be called into question because they can be automated and, and they can be substituted in part through AI. So will by all means, this development will by all means affect high qualified areas. So the situation is by no means uh, th that the Grow, the uh, jobs being created in growth industries will not benefit only those people in, fr in from high qualified people. There are as a high demand at present for people with uh, in-house um, uh, training who then obtain higher qualifications and then can obtain better better paid jobs. We can probably answer two more questions over there, please. Yes, you first, maybe. I cannot exactly say who asked for the floor first. Yeah, we need a microphone here in the front row. Johanna from Estonia. And uh, my question is, if uh, Germany and uh, Europe in general finds it important to be environmentally friendly, to reduce uh, dependency on Russian gas and also to maintain profits, why would it decommission uh, nuclear power? Because all of these are a part of uh, an urgent problem, uh, problem to Ukraine war crisis, inflation and the climate crisis. Nuclear power nowadays is safe, has very little waste, and as it appears from the outside, Decommissioning it out of anxieties that stem from the past, uh, for example, uh, Chernobyl, is a bad example for the rest of Europe and is just surrendering our uh, economic, monetary and martial future to fear. Thank you. Maybe we'll take another question. Yep, we'll take a second question. Lithuania, um, and I am the second prize winner of the Charlemagne European Youth Prize. So, congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes. Yeah, so, um, my question would be maybe a very broad one, but maybe I would like some short comments about yes. that. But um, also we have no three minutes. <laughs> we have three minutes left. As quick as possible, just to mention a few points. Um, we will have 1.2 billion climate migrants in the future in the whole world. We're also already right now experiencing one of the most serious droughts in Europe, in Central and Southern Europe. And um, you're talking about European prosperity and you're saying that we don't want to stop that. But my question is, do we not want to stop it or will it just stop itself? Like, do we have a plan on how we're going to tackle these problems that we've never had before? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
One last question, maybe the gentleman at the front. Yes, please. Hi, Josmar from Malta, mm -hmm. winner. My question is related to this matter. So we're talking a lot about digitization, but it also requires technological advancement. And Europe sometimes lacks in, the, in this matter. And there is legislation pushing cut-off dates of cars, etc. but we're not sure if the technology will, will reach there. Do you see risks in this and, and the impact on eco anxiety? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And we'll take your question and then we will go into the final round. I'm doing a voluntary year, European Youth Prize 2020, in the, and you. Uh, on a very important uh, subject like the need to uh, retrain uh, skills, also to develop basically uh, climate and environment uh, engagement among the youth and through uh, education. When we got the prize and then uh, President Macron uh, upholded this idea of European civic service, so basically helping all the countries to develop FSJ, BFD, uh, how it, it exists in, uh, in France, in Germany, so volunteering schemes supported by the state. It was also in order to maybe have the means at European level to address uh, basically uh, some common priority. And of course, environment is one of them. So maybe to have massive schemes uh, helping young volunteers to help for the climate, also to exchange and have mobility at European level. Right now, we have actually talk, and I will uh, conclude on that, uh, talk in uh, Estonia about developing this uh, national uh, civic uh, service of volunteering. Y your uh, question, please. And my question was, uh, <laughs> yesterday with uh, State Secretary Morgan, we mentioned that, yes, uh, climate environment related uh, volunteering could be a way not mm -hmm. only uh, to mm -hmm. uh, help uh, to address the issue, but also educate uh, young uh, people on that. So it's only one example, but my question was, how do you see um, okay. means and political means to basically, um, sorry, uh, to basically uh, do this retraining of the youth and to mobilize the youth? Okay, okay. thank you very much for your question. Very, very short. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you'll have to reduce this from your lunch break. In Romania, uh, we were the former Charlemagne Prize winners from Romania for the biggest European Affairs Forum. And my question is, because you mentioned the jobs of the future, what does quality employment mean for you? Because we see all over the countries in Europe, the parliaments trying to define what quality employment and the job of the future would be. And mm -hmm. what should be the request for the quality employment for all? Thank you. Okay. Okay, I would uh, like to close uh, the round of uh, questions now, but I'm always happy to receive so many questions, but we'll try to summarize all of this. But when you really look ahead of time and um, uh, uh, see how you can really customize the message for, for young people who are really active in the climate movement. What makes sense and uh, what is the prosperity that this generation can expect to have? How honest uh, should you be and what does this mean for the jobs of the future? Maybe you can summarize. Well, I think what has always helped me and uh, what is uh, probably also important for young people to accept is that uh, prosperity is not cast in stone. All generations uh, before and in future will have to work for this prosperity. Uh, prosperity is different from what our parents enjoyed and this prosperity also is subject to a certain change. People after the war actually uh, understood their, their meat dish on Sunday as uh, prosperity. Today people eat meat every day if they want to and lifelong learning, that's the second point. And knowledge is one thing, but the, is one thing, but preparedness uh, to relearn and learn for the rest of your life uh, is the second thing, and then we will be able to manage. Perhaps to come back to the penultimate question, 
how can we uh, encourage people and uh, encourage people to contribute to this transformation process? Companies, at least in my uh, experience, are able to change and to learn. I can say for my company, today we recruit people who come to us, or sometimes we have to approach them. They have a very cl clear idea of how a moral, responsible, just world, of how this world looks. They don't come to us because they find our company so uh, great and want to quickly earn money and have the big cars. They come to us because they want to get involved in work that can make a difference. They want to contribute uh, in other companies, in other organizations to improve these, including with the help of technology. But they want to be part of, of, a, of a social benefit. That we talk to completely different people than was the case 15 years ago. And with this attitude that you described just now, uh, you, you are highly welcome to many companies, including ours. Mr. Rivas. Yes, I think uh, overall very good questions. Uh, I don't want to go to, to have this discussion only like on, on negative things. I think we have been way too critical about Europe, uh, too critical about Germany. I think there are so many good things about Europe, Germany, and, and also digitalization changing the workplaces. Let's not uh, forget that uh, digitalization, especially expedited during COVID, has also offered us working over Zoom and, and enabling us to actually live in the countryside, perhaps in jobs, not all jobs, but, but many jobs, and this is increasingly trendy, and, and working uh, for a company that is in Berlin. That's possible now. That wasn't possible five years ago. And this creates tremendous opportunities for countryside and also perhaps people living in, in eastern part of, of Germany. Secondly, the same with education. Uh, again, like, let's take three, 30 years ago, you had to really go like, travel and pay a lot for your education to, to get it uh, abroad. Now there is millions of courses uh, available on the internet. Yes, not all of them are formal. Some you still need to pay for, but th there's endless of opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, and my last point for the young people here is, I mean, if you want to be successful, work for it. <laughs> there's, it's, not, it's not the task of your parents. It's not the task of your government. Exactly. It's your task. Go for it. Learn, study, work hard, and you will succeed. There is no other way. And if you ask what is the uh, sphere or what is the sector you should work for, we don't have the answer. You do. You know better what are the sectors of the future. Never ever rely on your parents or government alone. Rely on yourself and you will succeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both the uh, contributes from the recent uh, Youth Prize laureates, as well as my, the uh, comments from my uh, Estonian colleague, they uh, enrich our debate in Germany. If you were to talk like this in uh, many German debates, you would be warm welcome. But in the Eastern European countries, Bulgaria, uh, for example, this desire to do things yourself, to change things yourself, to take responsibility yourself, to get involved in voluntary uh, schemes, to go to engage yourself beyond your work area. Yeah, as uh, my colleague said, don't moan, get stuck in. It's up to you to decide whether you succeed or not. The government has to uh, create the framework conditions to enable everybody to get stuck in. And they don't want a situation where if they have new ideas, the government uh, creates so many barriers to prevent this from happening. We must enable people to achieve their ideas. And I think that's something that we can learn from people in Central and Eastern Europe. I would like to thank you all cordially, uh, Mr. Laschet, uh, um, Mr. Roivas, uh, Mrs. Kolak, and uh, Mr. Grobowski. Well, uh, I think with such questions asked, uh, we shouldn't be worried about our European way of living. So much to win, you said, Mr. Roivas. Let's go for it. Thank you very much, and now we will break for lunch. Next door.